It is my it is my great pleasure to introduce Penny Goldberg, president of the Econometric Society in the year 2021. Penny is the LU professor of economics at Yale. Before being at Yale, she has been in the faculty at Princeton and Columbia. She received her PhD at Stanford and her BA from the University of Freiburg in Germany. Penny has done path-breaking research on a very broad range of topics in international trade and development. Her work has three distinctive features. First, she addresses highly policy relevant issues and draws from her work very important and precise policy implications. Second, she combines theory and empirics with the very novel and creative ideas. And third, she has used a variety of methods using structural reforms, uh, structural estimation and reduced form estimation. Uh, she has written an amazing number of papers. Let me just mention some of her most important contributions. She has written on the determinants of trade policy. In fact, uh, I think the first paper by Penny that I think uh, I read a long time ago was um, uh, the paper with the Giovanni Maggi published in the EAR, where she brought to the data the implications of lobbying. Uh, I think it was one of the first papers uh, in political economy to have rigorous tests of uh, the implications of lobbying and more generally of models of political economy. She has done a very extensive work on the effects of uh, trade liberalizations in several developing countries on a variety of outcomes. In particular, uh, she has studied the liberalizations in India in the 1990s, showing that uh, trade liberalizations bring about uh, product innovations and improvements in productivity growth. She has uh, studied the implications of uh, uh, these effects on the welfare of producers and consumers, showing that in particular liberalizations of intermediate products reduce the cost of producers, but uh, uh, this uh, is often not passed on onto consumers, but increases uh, profit margins. She has studied the effects of liberalizations on inequality and income distributions, uh, and focusing on Latin America on a variety of uh, labor market outcomes. Uh, she has worked on the consequences of the protection of intellectual property rights across countries, uh, showing that uh, more strict enforcement has uh, uh, the effect of uh, reducing the availability of, uh, in this case, uh, pharmaceutical products in developing countries with small effect uh, on, on prices. She has worked uh, on exchange rate pass-through, uh, explaining why it is incomplete. Uh, she has studied the effects uh, of exchange rates uh, on uh, uh, patterns of international pricing of similar products, uh, explaining why similar products are priced in different countries uh, with uh, uh, regard to price discrimination as an instance of uh, price discrimination. Her more recent contributions have looked at uh, the effects of uh, the trade wars brought about by the Trump administration in the US uh, on uh, uh, different uh, districts, showing that the main beneficiaries of these trade wars, not surprisingly, have been producers in highly contested uh, districts, while uh, the net losers where the Republican counties that suffered from retaliation from abroad. Uh, more recently, he's also studied the gender discrimination and the measurement of growth and learning outcomes in developing countries. Besides these and many other path-breaking contributions, Penny has provided important services to the profession and has had important roles as a policy advisor or policy maker. She was chief economist at the World Bank between 2018 and 2020. Uh, before that, she was chief editor of the AR for several years. She was vice president of the American Economic Association, 
And let me add, she is the first female president of the Econometric Society. And uh, I have experienced uh, in recent years firsthand her good judgment uh, and professional uh, expertise. Because of uh, all these uh, past breaking contributions, uh, Penny has received several awards and recognitions, uh, amongst others. She is a member of uh, the National Academy of Sciences and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, from the Sloan Foundation, and uh, she has received the, the Borasaki Prize in the Social Sciences. Today, she will speak about the man side constraints in development, the role of market size, trade, and inequality. Penny, I'm looking forward to it, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Guido, for this very uh, generous introduction, for all your nice words. Um, th this address marks the end of my year as president of the Econometric Society. And, and before I get going and deliver the address, I would like to spend a few minutes thanking the many people who have, who have made sure that this year runs smoothly despite the many challenges uh, we faced. And uh, for this particular meeting, the North American Winter Meeting, I would like to, to thank in particular the program chair, uh, Jesse Shapiro, who together with Mary Beth Bellando Zaniboni uh, has worked uh, tirelessly to make sure that um, we have a great program. Uh, Mary Beth, um, you, many, many of you may know her as the publications manager of the Econometric Society, but she also plays a very important role in North America, in the North American region. Uh, committee, um, and, and, and she has uh, helped in this particular instance, she has helped organize uh, the, the current meeting. And of course, as always, I would like to thank the, the people who are essential to the functioning of the Econometric Society. So um, our Executive Vice President, Enrique Santana, our Executive Director, Lynn Hogan, and finally, our Project Manager, Ridu Johori, who works closely with ATIV and has ensured that our virtual meetings have been successful in the past year. Uh, having said that, I very much hope that this is the last virtual meeting and that next time we meet and next time uh, you know, Guido delivers his presidential address, we'll be able to meet in person. So with this introduction, uh, uh, let me um, now share my screen and um, give me a few minutes. Okay. Um, I hope you can see it. Um, as Guido said, the title of the address is Demand Side Constraints in Development, the Role of Market Size, Trade, and Inequality. Um, and this is actually work that was inspired by my tenure at the World Bank. So before I present the address, let me briefly, let me spend a few minutes explaining the title and tell you what this talk is about. So um, when I entered the World Bank, I realized early on that there is a, a necessity, there is a need for a new macro vision for development. Um, uh, of course, when we talk about development, uh, there are many different meanings one can attach to this term. There are many different theories about what drives development, many different taxonomies. For the purpose of this talk, I think it will be useful to adopt a taxonomy uh, introduced by Danny Roderick in a book in 2016, where Danny distinguishes between two broad sets of categories of theories. Uh, the first one, he labels the theories of structural transformation, uh, so these theories are based on the idea of a dual economy. There are two sectors in an economy, uh, one low productivity and one high productivity uh, sector. And so development involves the transition from the low to the high productivity sector. And then there are the theories that emphasize fundamentals. And by fundamentals, um, we uh, mean human capital, infrastructure, institutions, and so on. And of course, uh, uh, developing fundamentals 
requires long-term investments. Um, needless to say, I don't think of these theories as uh, uh, theories that compete with each other. I think they are complementary. Um, I, I also tend to think of them as, rather than using the term structural transformation and fundamentals, I, kept, I, I think we can also think of those as being theories that emphasize demand versus supply side factors. And what I mean by that is uh, in structural transformation theories, the demand side of the economy is key. Uh, when we talk about fundamentals, the, 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 the key uh, premise is that if countries adopt the right policies on the supply side, then good things are going to happen in the long run. Uh, as I said, I believe both sets of theories are very important. Uh, there is a very large literature in development on supply side constraints. Uh, the Handbook of Economic Growth uh, chapter by Banerjee and Duflo back in 2005 provides a very good overview. Um, among other things, they emphasize constraints uh, uh, you know, in capital markets on the supply side. Um, in my own tenure in the World Bank, I emphasized constraints on human capital. I think these are first order. There is no question about that. That said, the thesis of this talk is that um, the constraints currently in many developing countries are more on the demand side, not on the supply side. And these constraints are becoming binding. Um, in particular, I'm going to argue that the old paradigm of structural transformation is under strain. And uh, uh, small market size is becoming a binding constraint, um, especially in small countries and especially in Africa. So in some sense, you can think of the point I'm going to make as a point that's parallel to a point that Larry Summers has been making for many years um, in, the, in, in a very different context in the context of advanced economies, where Larry has pointed out that weak growth in aggregate demand uh, contributes to secular stagnation. And it's a source of many problems in advanced countries. Uh, I too am going to emphasize demand side, but in a very different context in the context of developing countries. So just briefly, what do we mean by structural transformation? So structural, the structural transformation paradigm involves a transition, uh, typically a transition from agriculture to industrialization, to manufacturing, and then services. And uh, this process, um, especially the rise of service of the service sector, is uh, goes hand in hand with urbanization. Um, in this process, openness and export-led industrialization play an important role. Um, and as a result, the demand side is never a constraint, uh, or, or rather, the demand side is really what drives growth. Uh, if you think about large economies, um, think of India or China, the demand side is not a problem. They can rely on their own economies uh, to foster growth. Um, when it comes to smaller economies, uh, if you are in, a, in an open world, um, the small economies can always tap into international markets um, and use these lucrative markets to generate revenue. Uh, so effectively what they do when they connect to international markets is they increase their effective market size. And then in turn, they can use the revenues they get from exports to invest in the human capital and, the, and in the other fundamentals I mentioned uh, earlier. So, but the driver in all these theories tends to be the demand side. Uh, of course, the reality is much more complex than these stylized models. There have been various reviews of this literature. Um, I'm thinking here in particular of various papers by Doug Gollin and uh, co-authors or the, uh, the review chapter by Herendorf, Rogerson, and Valentini in 2014 that provide overviews of uh, theories of structural transformation. And, and of course, the reality departs in very important ways from these stylized models. Uh, still, I would argue that the experience in East Asia in the last, the last decade, so especially China, South Korea, uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, very, mu very much conforms to this paradigm. Uh, so this is the model of structural transformation, the export, the model of export-led industrialization I talked about before. Uh, why am I saying that this is under strain? So what is different today? Uh, three factors. So first, we are faced with increased automation. So that means uh, low-skill labor is increasingly being substituted by robots, and that erodes the natural comparative advantage that many developing countries, many, many countries, many low-wage countries um, had in world markets. Uh, second, we've seen in the last few years a backlash against globalization in many countries, not just in the US. 
and the rise of economic nationalism. And, and this, in my opinion, poses a very serious threat to globalization in, um, and to the inclusion of developing countries in the world trading system. And finally, we have another trend that, again, Danny Roderick labeled premature deindustrialization. So in many developing countries, we see countries jumping from uh, agriculture to services without ever industrializing. And um, to a certain extent, one might think that this is a positive development. Um, uh, services have often been uh, uh, hailed by policymakers as the new frontier, as a way to jump into the 21st century for many developing countries. The service sector is clean, manufacturing is dirty, so services seem at first to be consistent with the, um, the various uh, objectives that uh, someone concerned about climate change would be. But, but um, uh, this optimism ignores many other factors. One of them is that services is a highly heterogeneous category. Uh, some services foster growth, foster productivity increases, some do not. Um, relatedly, uh, the, there is work again by Golin uh, and co-authors that, sh that shows that in Africa, we've seen urbanization without industrialization. And that has a lot to do with the kind of services that countries adopt. So in many cases, they adopt consumption services. Um, this is construction, uh, drivers, um, tourism. Um, uh, these do not tend to generate productivity increases and long-term growth. Um, these are to be contrasted with production services that have many of the positive uh, features that we usually associate with manufacturing. Um, uh, relatedly, there, there is a, a recent, a very nice recent paper by uh, my colleagues, um, Michael Peters and Fabrizio Tilibodi, together with um, a graduate student at, at, at Yale, FAN, uh, where they asked the question in the context of India, is growth in India service-led or service biased? So in other words, is, is India grown because of, has India grown because of services or uh, are services grow, uh, growing in India because India is growing? And, and the answer to this question in their paper is actually very nuanced. So, so the point I'm, I'm trying to make here is that even if we believe that services are going to be the, the new engine of growth, um, so far, the message the, from, from, from the evidence we've had so far uh, tends to be very mixed. So uh, continuing with the motivation behind this talk, let me start with a casual observation. Uh, I already mentioned India. So India has been growing fast, but I think most uh, observers would agree that the growth has not been driven by manufacturing or by exports. Um, that has can lead one to the following hypothesis. If you have a large domestic market like India, then it's easier to develop, it's easier to grow, uh, even when the economy is closed, even when the economy does not rely on exports. And the reason is there is the potential for this country to realize internal economies of scale. Now, there's a counterexample to this hypothesis, and this is Nigeria, um, also a very large country, uh, very rich in natural resources. Nigeria has experienced periods of fast growth, but no sustained development and no poverty reduction. Uh, so if you compare in India to Nigeria, there are of course many, many differences, but one difference that is quite striking is the very high degree of inequality that persists in Nigeria, even relative to India, which is also a very unequal country. So that leads to, to an additional hypothesis, namely that development requires a certain degree of equality. So that if you have a positive shock, let's say through an increase in agricultural productivity or, um, or uh, through oil exports, um, then this positive shock can actually trickle down to the population at large um, it can foster growth and it can generate uh, sustained poverty reduction. So in, in this uh, story, in this story that I just told, the, uh, told you, a certain degree of equality is prerequisite for development and for growth. Uh, so, so this uh, idea may seem intuitive. This is what started this project, but it raises several questions for an economist. So the first question is, how do we operationalize this idea? So in particular, what does large market, meaning in this context. So in other words, what, how large does a market need to be for this mechanism to be relevant? Um, what does equality mean and what is development? And, and finally, if a country 
if a developing country is very small, so this option is not uh, possible, so it cannot rely on the market, on its own market size, then um, what are its options in a world that's, that's closing, that's turning inward? Uh, so in order to think about these questions, um, one needs to develop a conceptual framework, and this is what I'm going to show you next. The conceptual framework is based on a working paper with Tristan Reed, um, who's an economist at the World Bank, and uh, the, the working paper is called Income Distribution, International Integration and Sustained Poverty Reduction. In this paper, we, we use a theoretical framework that was inspired by a paper by Murphy, Schleifer and Vishni in 89. And that paper itself is a formalization of many earlier ideas by, by many development economists, but most importantly by Arthur Lewis, by uh, all the work of Arthur Lewis in the 50s. Uh, by the way, the paper by Murphy and Hall is not the, the famous, their famous JPE paper on the big push, it's a different paper. And I will, I will uh, show you the framework in a minute. So this framework gives rise to an empirical threshold model, which is going to be similar to an industrial organization model of entry. Um, such models have been considered by Bresnahan and Dries uh, early in the 90s. So um, what we do with Tristan is we estimate this empirical model using panel data from multiple countries. And then we use this, uh, this, the results to calculate among other things, how large a market needs to be uh, so that it can rely on internal economies of scale. Um, and also among other things to, to assess how important is international integration and how important is equality in such a world. And, before I get to the specifics, let me give you the main takeaways. Um, uh, uh, so this paper, um, as, as Guido mentioned, I'm, I'm a trade economist, but, but I did not mean to uh, present a trade paper here or make the case for free trade. Yet at the end of this project, our main takeaway was that trade is really essential for development of smaller economies. Um, so in particular, what we find is that the threshold for development in the last few deca decades is around 300 billion people under autarky. So in other words, in a world in, in which countries are not connected to other countries, you need to have at least 300 million people in your own population to, uh, to be able to uh, overcome poverty. And so this is, needless to say, this is a huge number. <laughs> there are very few countries that, uh, that, that could, could rely on their domestic economies. India and China are the only ones. Uh, so um, that, that by itself implies that trade is uh, very important. In some sense, you may, uh, you may think this is not surprising. Uh, ancient people have always known that. Um, I'm Greek. Um, the first thing we learn when we uh, were taught Greek history is how important trade was for the flourishing of ancient Greek culture. Um, so uh, in some sense, the message is not surprising. This message is not surprising, but perhaps it's a message that, that, that we need to, to, to remind ourselves of, given the current uh, climate ab uh, about trade and globalization. The second message, is that uh, in the absence of trade, so if we don't have the degree of international integration that we desire, a certain degree of equality is crucial for growth. And the reason for that is equality allows a country to increase its effective market size. So in that sense, you can think of growth and equality as being complements in early stages of development. Uh, that message is less obvious because there is a, a big debate in the literature as to whether growth and equality, growth and inequality go hand in hand. And the point we're making here is that at least in very early stages in development, when countries try to overcome extreme poverty, a certain degree of equality is really important, especially when countries are small and especially when countries are not connected to the rest of the world. And finally, in terms of um, actual policy, in the absence of global trade, of, multilateral, of multilateralism, uh, deep integration under regional umbrella could increase effective market size and aid development. So let me uh, now uh, give you a brief roadmap of what I'm going to talk about uh, in the rest of the talk. I try to give you an overview um, so far. Um, I, will, I will start by presenting the theoretical framework in, in more detail. Um, then I will explain how we go from theory to data and um, discuss some general conceptual issues that come up not only in this project, but more generally when one does empirical work in economics. And then I will talk about the empirical implementation 
the measurement of the various variables and the challenges we face, and then results and conclusions. So uh, the theoretical framework, as I said, is inspired by the paper by um, uh, Murphy and Tall. Um, consider a small open economy. Open is in quotes, and you'll see in a moment why. Uh, in this economy, there are three sectors. There is agriculture, that is food, manufacturing, and the cash crop. So the, the, there is no trade in manufacturers. So that's why I put the open in quotes. It's not really an open economy the way we think about most countries. It's a small country that uses this cash crop only for exports. Um, so uh, uh, examples uh, would uh, include, again, a country like Nigeria that produces oil and oil is used mainly for exports or many countries in Africa that produce minerals or let's say diamonds they don't use them for domestic consumption, they just export those. And in return, they import food. So there is some trade in this economy, but this trade is very, uh, very limited. Services are not in the model, but in principle, they could be treated exactly like manufacturing. Importantly, there are two technologies in manufacturing. There is a traditional technology that's a constant returns to scale technology. And there is a new technology, the, the increasing returns to scale technology. And so this is where the duality of the structural transformation literature comes in. This is a model with these two, with these dual technologies. Uh, development uh, is, is uh, equivalent in this uh, model with uh, industrialization, and it involves the transition from the constant returns to scale to the increasing returns uh, to scale technology. Uh, in, in, in the world of the model, the reason this is the case is because the new technology, the adoption of increasing returns to scale, increases productivity and wages and reduces poverty. But we can also think of many reasons outside this model why we think uh, increasing returns to scale, adoption of this new technology fosters development. There may be externalities, spillovers, and so on, learning by doing. These are not in the model, but there is a lot of empirical evidence that would support this, uh, this conjecture that increasing returns to scale are associated with development. Uh, the adoption of this technology has a fixed cost, and that implies that there is a minimum threshold market size for adoption. So this is key. This minimum threshold market size, I call it here N star, can be achieved using either the domestic or the international market. So in the domestic market, the role of middle class is going to be crucial. And what is middle class in this model? So in this model, middle class involves is the number of consumers who are up above a subsistence level Z, but below a level um, at which luxury goods are consumed. So if you think about the consumption patterns in this economy, the consumption patterns are as follows. Consumers who are very poor um, and have no assets, they consume just food. Uh, this is the only, the only product they consume. Then the middle class uses the first Z units of their income to buy food. Once they satisfy this demand, they start buying industrialized goods. And these are goods that are produced with a mass technology with the increasing returns to scale technology. Okay, so think of people buying cars or refrigerators or, or kitchen appliances in general. And then there is the upper class that buys food, industrialized, mass produced goods, but also luxury goods that are produced with the traditional technology. And you can think of these goods as being imported products, important luxury products, or other products that are consumed by very few. The important difference to the mass produced goods is that these luxury goods are produced with a traditional technology, okay? So uh, the role of middle class has been emphasized in many different contexts in developing, uh, uh, in, in the literature on development. Um, and there are essentially three reasons that, um, that, that uh, people think the middle class may be important for development. One reason is that uh, many think of middle class as being the class that produces entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship is important for development. A second reason is that um, the middle class is often associated with values that again, we think are important for development. So for example, placing high value on education and human capital or saving and savings are important for development. However, there's also a third reason and this paper falls into uh, this, this paper is based on this third reason, namely that the middle class has purchasing power. So the reason the middle class is here important is because the middle class is the, the class that can actually buy these mass-produced industrialized goods. 
So in this setup, when can a country uh, fail to develop, fail to industrialize? You can think of two main reasons. One is the economy is too poor to start with, and that means they are, the rents are too low to support the adoption of these increasing returns to scale technology. So if that's the case, then a wealth boost, an initial positive shock may help. And this shock may come either from agriculture. Um, this is why agriculture is always viewed as a leading sector. And again, this point goes back to Arthur Lewis in 1953. Um, so in this, in this setup, uh, an increase in agricultural productivity raises wages, it raises rents, and it shifts labor from agriculture to manufacturing. So this starts a process uh, in which the middle class, then there's more money in the middle class, and the middle class spends this money to buy industrialized goods, and this sets off a virtuous process. Uh, the same can also be achieved through exports, through an export of cash crops. And again, you can think of this, um, uh, the, the exports of uh, uh, cash crops are used to import food, and that is equivalent to, uh, to an increase in agricultural productivity. I would argue that um, this factor, namely that the economy is too poor and uh, lacks a wealth boost, has not been a binding factor in developing countries in the last two decades. And the reason I'm saying that is because there are many countries, especially in Africa, where poverty tends to be concentrated these days, that are rich in natural resources. So they've got plenty of positive shocks. There are plenty of positive oil price shocks or commodity price shocks. You can think of all these shocks as providing this positive wealth boost that countries need in order to, to, to get this process jump-started. Nevertheless, we don't see development taking off. We see short periods of poverty reduction of growth that are followed uh, by, by, by stagnation. Uh, so that brings me to the second condition. What's the second condition you need for development in this framework? Uh, if the economy is too, is too unequal, then it will also fail to develop, even if you have this positive wealth shock. And one reason for that is if the economy is dominated by a few oligarchs, if the wealth is held in the hands of very few, then there no, there's no trickle down. Um, another reason could be if the middle class is not sufficiently large, then uh, there are no spillover effects. So the ownership of, of profits by this upper class generates demand for luxury goods, that there may be demand for uh, uh, luxury homes and for drivers and so on. Um, so all this generates demand for these luxury goods, but there, is no, there are no positive spillovers to the economy at large. Again, let me emphasize that all this would be much less relevant if we had free trade, because then uh, the market size would be determined by the size of the international market. So what happens in the domestic economy tends to be less relevant and whatever problems a country faces domestically can be to a certain extent alleviated by tapping into international markets. So to summarize what are the implications for development, what a country needs is A, an initial boost, the wealth effect that can come from the uh, increase in agricultural productivity or from exports of a cash crop or another natural resource, oil again comes to mind. And second, it needs a large enough market. In the absence of trade, this market has to be domestic. So, and in that case, a certain degree of equality, meaning in this particular context, middle class is important. Uh, let me also spend a few minutes um, highlighting the role of trade in this framework. Um, the trade plays th three roles in this model. So first, as I mentioned, the initial wealth boost can come from exports. So that um, is the traditional force of, of comparative advantage. The countries tend to export the products in which they are uh, relatively abundant. And if a country is abundant in oil, uh, naturally it's going to export that. Uh, so that's already, um, that's, the, that, that, that's a point that's traditionally emphasized in the literature. The second one that I did not talk much about is, but is in practice important, is that trade also allows for lower fixed cost of adoption. So when um, firms adopt a new technology, they, they need to pay a fixed cost of technology adoption. Uh, this cost will be lower in a country that imports capital goods or other intermediate products. And again, this, as we don't mention, this is a point that I made in the context in my work uh, on India in the context of the Indian trade liberalization. But the most important role in this framework 
is that trade increases the market size in an open economy. And therefore it allows the adoption of the increasing returns to scale technology. So this particular role is somewhat different from the role increasing returns to scale have played in trade models. Of course, increasing returns to scale have been emphasized in the trade literature. You can read the book by Helpman and Krugman back in 85. But in trade traditionally, the question is what are the patterns of trade and what are the gains from trade in the presence of increasing returns to scale. Uh, here, what I'm saying is that if trade is what allows a country to adopt increasing returns to scale technologies in the first place. So without trade, this would have been impossible. And so in some sense, you can think of the point that I'm making as a point that's related to the dynamic gains from trade. It's an effect that is going to be more relevant uh, over time as these countries adopt these new technologies. And in some sense, it can also explain why the gains from trade can be very large. We all think that the gains from trade are very large, even though in traditional models, if you plug in the, the traditional formulas um, and you do quantitative analysis, it's very hard to produce numbers that, that are quantitatively uh, important. Uh, coming back to the model, uh, what I present is a highly stylized model that uh, uh, highlighted some ideas. Um, so when I say bring the model to the data, what does this really mean? Uh, what we're not going to do is test the model. And I think there's no point in testing uh, models in general, but especially a model like this, because we know it's false. Uh, by the way, there is a very interesting piece by Paul Krugman back in, in 1994, titled uh, The Fall and Rise of Development Economics, where uh, Paul talks about the value of economic models. And he talks about uh, a meteorologist from the University of Chicago, David Fultz, who try to explain weather patterns using a flat uh, dishpan. And of course, we think of this as being uh, unrealistic. The earth is not a dishpan, but nevertheless, he used this model to uh, highlight some ideas. So, so that's how I think about this model. It's just a model that one uses to structure their thoughts, but it would be naive from us to think that we can take it to the data and test it. Um, along the same lines, Ed Lever has a, a famous uh, quote from his um, Handbook of International Economics back in 95, estimate do not test. And, and this is what we will try to do here. So the approach is as follows. We, we adopt an empirical approach that focuses on the main ideas of the framework. You'll see in a moment how. Uh, and we estimate a model, an empirical model that's inspired by this framework. So what the theoretical framework uh, uh, does is it dictates which variables are to be included and in which particular form they are going to enter the model. Then when, once we estimate the model, we ask the question, do the estimated parameters look sensible? And also what's the predictive power of the framework relative to a kitchen sink approach where we relate our development measure to a bunch of uh, variables that one typically associates with development. And then with the parameters in place, with the parameter estimates in place, we can ask the questions I posed before, namely, what's the role of domestic versus international market size in development, and also do some counterfactual analysis. So what, what would happen if the world were closed? What would happen if we had more or less equality and so on? Uh, coming now to the specific, how do we operationalize this framework? So measurement. Uh, the development is a very broad term. And in this particular framework, development has a very specific meaning. It's associated with industrialization. And in turn, industrialization means in this framework, adoption of the increasing returns to scale technology. So in principle, you might think that the, the way to go is try to measure increasing returns to scale. Uh, however, we know from the uh, empirical literature, so especially the industrial organization literature, that direct measurement of increasing returns to scale has been very difficult, it has been elusive. That said, there is a lot of evidence, especially in recent years, that suggests that economies of scale are important. And here I'm thinking uh, of a lot of work in trade that has indirectly, has, has tried to use uh, very creative approaches to indirectly infer the existence of economies of scale. And there seems, there seems to be uh, evidence that these are pervasive. Um, uh, also, we are not interested in the increasing returns to scale per se. So increasing returns to scale is it's just here in this framework, it's just a means towards better living standards. So for all these reasons, one needs a more practical definition of development. And for the purpose of this uh, talk and for this project, we 
decided to associate development with sustained poverty reduction. Um, why? Well, sustained poverty reduction is a very important condition for long-term development of a country. So all high-income countries, all advanced countries have eliminated extreme poverty. Um, the World Bank or the United Nations, they consider one of the most important goals of their respective institutions to reduce ex extreme poverty. So this is living on less than $1.9 PPP per day. And why sustained? Because we want to exclude temporary episodes of apparent poverty reduction that are due to, uh, let's say, a commodity price boom. I gave you the example of Nigeria uh, before. You can have periods where the, the commodity prices go up or the oil prices go up. And then temporarily, poverty goes down in these countries only to come back a few years later. So we wanted to adopt a measure. No measure is perfect, but we wanted to adopt a measure that uh, it, it captures this uh, notion that in some countries we see a sustained pattern of poverty going down year after year. So this is going to be our measure of development. And then uh, the empirical framework we uh, develop is inspired very much by the industrial organization literature on entry. So in some sense, you can think of this project as being a project that marries the ideas of Murphy et, et al from 89 with the, the ideas of Presidekan and recent entry, um, they've had several papers uh, in the 90s, in the early 90s. So uh, to be more specific, in our framework, development is associated with this adoption of the increasing returns to scale technology. In turn, the technology adoption by uh, a monopolist, by imperfectly competitive firms, leads naturally to a break-even condition. And the break-even condition is that the variable profits that this technology generates have to be equal to the fixed cost. Okay, so uh, this break-even condition is very similar to the break-even condition in entry models. And just like Bresnikan and Ries, one can use it to estimate the threshold market size. So in other words, how large does the market need to be to, uh, to support the adoption of the increasing returns to scale technology. So in the IO literature, the question that Bresnahan and Dries and others posed is how large does a local market need to be to support a certain number of firms, one firm, two firms, et cetera. In our uh, framework, the question is how large does a national market need to be in order to support the entry of at least one firm that, that produces um, according to this increasing returns to, to uh, scale technology. So one advantage of thinking about this problem this way is one does not need data on firms' prices and quantities, which are impossible to get, especially uh, in the international context. So instead, one can rely on, on widely available market-level data that capture market, uh, market fundamentals and market size. So uh, given that this is a, a, a keynote address, I will try to minimize um, equations, but, but um, let me just show you the minimum um, to describe the empirical framework. The threshold cross crossing model looks as follows. The profit in this increasing returns to scale sector is given by variable profits minus fixed costs. So variable profits are in turn the product of market size plus uh, times variable profits per capita minus the fixed costs F. Um, if uh, plus an error term that captures everything that's left out of the model plus measurement error, if one assumes that the, the error term is normally distributed, then one can uh, use a profit model to estimate the probability of entry in the increasing returns to scale sector. So in this note, in my notation, M, capital M, denotes uh, a vector of variables that, that capture the market size. Z uh, denotes uh, demand shifters and W are cost shifters. So uh, you can see the way this is written, um, uh, we model variable profits uh, as a function of demand shifters and cost uh, shifters, uh, fixed costs as a, a function of cost shifters. Uh, so that's why I said before that all one needs to implement this approach is information on market level uh, variables. So here's where the, the model really comes in, where the theoretical framework comes in. So, so first in, in, in the fact that we have this empirical threshold crossing model, but then in the way um, we decide what variables to include in market size or per capita variable profits. So the, the choice of variables is very much informed 
by the underlying theoretical framework. Uh, so specifically, the main variables we include are the population, the raw population in the country below middle class. So what I mean by that is the, the number of people that are present in a country. Um, second, the share of the population that belongs to a global middle class. I will come to that in a moment. And then we use two measures of international integration because in reality, of course, countries are connected to international markets. They don't live in autarky. One um, measure measures international integration in terms of the population, of the aggregate population to which a country is connected. And the second measure captures um, international integration in terms of the income of the integrated market. And again, I will come back, I will talk about these measures in more detail in a moment. The per capita variable profits, again, the, the specification is very much inspired by the theoretical framework. We model per capita variable profits as a function of past export growth and past agricultural productivity. So the idea being that these are the factors that can generate this wealth boost that I talked about before. The fixed costs are again modeled as a function of observables. And here we put in all the variables that uh, the, the literature on institutions has, uh, or on political economy of development has suggested that they're really important for development. These are long-term factors that cannot be changed in the short run. Some of them are geography factors, tropical climate, desert climate, distance to coast, um, ruggedness, but there are other factors, for example, British legal origins or French legal origins that capture institutions. And the idea is all these factors um, affect, among other things, the price of land, but also the cost of adopting these new technologies. So in this framework, we can actually, once we've estimated the model, we can also compute, once we have estimated the threshold market size, which is going to be given by this expression at the bottom. Uh, so the ratio of fixed cost to, uh, to variable profits. So uh, now, uh, having shown you the, the, the empirical framework, one of the main challenges is how to measure these variables, especially in a way that allows us to uh, use data across many countries. I already mentioned that we measure development as sustained poverty reduction. So here briefly the steps that we use in order to measure it. Um, and uh, I'm sure one can have many issues with this particular way. Um, I, I don't think there's a perfect way of measuring development or poverty reduction, uh, but one can always conduct robustness analysis. So we use data from the World Bank's PovCalNet um, to uh, estimate, you know, to compute the national extreme poverty headcount. So we focus on extreme poverty, people who live under 1.90 uh, PPP 2011 US dollars. Uh, then we have data from 1981 to 2015. So what we do is we segment this data to five year periods, 81, 85, 86, 90, and so on. There are missing observations. If there are missing observations, we uh, interpolate this, uh, the missing data using a linear trend. And then for each period, we create an indicator of whether poverty has declined in this year relative to the previous year. And then we look at the five-year intervals and we ask the question, did poverty decline in every single year in these intervals or not? And if the answer is yes, then we consider poverty to have been declined in a, to, to have had sustained poverty reduction in that five-year interval. If poverty sometimes goes down, sometimes goes up, then we, um, then we say that we did not have sustained poverty reduction during this period. So in, uh, when we construct the sample, we eliminate all countries that have headcount below 3% in all years, even advanced countries, even countries like the United States have, still have some extreme poverty, but according to the definitions of, uh, but, but, but this is to be expected, one cannot eliminate it completely. Uh, so just, you know, again, there, are, uh, there is clearly measurement error in the way we construct this measure. So one question that one may have is how reasonable um, are the, uh, the patterns, the poverty reduction patterns we get when we use this measure. And I, I wanted to show you some graphs, uh, nothing, that I'm going to show you is going to be particularly surprising, but I just want to make the point that the way we construct our measure of development of poverty reduction tends to correspond to common wisdom. So this is poverty reduction for some countries in Asia. You see the very fast poverty reduction that we all read about. The red line is China. You see sustained 
poverty reduction over the last few decades. Um, you see the same thing uh, actually in India, but the line is less steep. So you have poverty reduction, but the, 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 the slope is not as steep. Uh, Vietnam, again, very steep poverty reduction in the last few decades. Um, in Malaysia, the line is pretty flat, but overall in Asia, you see the, 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 the growth miracle that people talk about. This is the corresponding graph for Africa. And you can see immediately that the graph for Africa looks very different. We have periods of poverty reduction. So especially in countries like Ethiopia, in Ethiopia, we have poverty reduction over the last few decades, as we know. Um, in South Africa, um, uh, that's the, the red line. Um, again, we have uh, poverty reduction, sustained poverty reduction over several years. Um, not so in uh, Nigeria or let's say in the Cote d'Ivoire, where again, we, we, we see some periods of poverty reduction, but they tend to be brief and then followed by periods of stagnation. So uh, some interesting patterns, um, uh, I will mention them briefly. Uh, I think one could write a paper just describing this data because there are, there are many interesting uh, uh, patterns one can uh, detect. So the first one is, so here what I, I show you is what, how poverty reduction, sustained poverty reduction relates to sustained per capita GDP growth, uh, real per capita GDP growth. And our measure of sustained per capita GDP growth is constructed in a similar way as the poverty reduction measure. So uh, we want to see um, GDP growth persisting over several years. So uh, the first thing that uh, one notes, if you look at the number uh, highlighted in yellow, is that uh, poverty reduction and growth are highly correlated. They're positively correlated. This is why, this is why economists always emphasize that perhaps the best way to achieve poverty reduction is to make sure that an economy grows. So this is certainly true. Uh, uh, if you focus on the cases where we had sustained poverty reduction, seven, in 76% of these cases, uh, we also had growth. However, poverty reduction is not synonymous with growth. We also have many instances of, of growth, of uh, sustained per capita GDP growth that did not lead to poverty reduction. So they are positively correlated, but they are not synonymous. So this is the first uh, message. The second one is here I show you for these five year periods we constructed, what, how many, uh, what's the percentage of countries in each region of the world um, that has achieved sustained poverty reduction in uh, each of these five year intervals. And the first impression, if one looks at this graph casually, is that there has been progress, there has been sub substantial progress towards sustained poverty reduction. Um, one interesting pattern is if you look at the years 2006 to 2010, you see sustained poverty reduction in almost every part of the world. And this is despite the fact that advanced economies were facing a major financial crisis during that time. So this is interesting because it shows that one can achieve progress even when the advanced world, when, when the, the, the richer countries are facing uh, an economic crisis. Um, th th there are two countries, there are two regions that stand out for the lack of progress in particular periods. The one is Latin America between 85 and uh, 2005. Uh, where poverty reduction uh, uh, is very, very low. And the other one is Sub-Saharan Africa. And again, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and it's well known that until the 90s, uh, nothing was happening and poverty reduction was very high. Uh, so this is our poverty, our, our poverty reduction measure. Now, let me tell you a little bit about how we construct our measures of international integration. Uh, the measures are based uh, on a database constructed by Hoffman, Osnago, and Ruto. These are economists at the World Bank. And they uh, codify the various provisions of international trade agreements to, um, to examine which countries have signed which provisions of which agreements. So what we do in order to uh, construct our measure of international integration is the following. We aggregate for each country, we take the sum of the population of all countries with which this particular country has signed trade agreements, right? So if I look at a country like um, Vietnam, I look at which countries <coughs> Vietnam has signed trade agreements with, uh, 
and then I aggregate, I sum up the populations of these countries, but I don't, we don't take the unweighted sum. We weigh this population by the number of provisions of these trade agreements as a share of the maximum. So the maximum number of provisions they can uh, sign is 32. Not all countries sign all provisions. So the idea here is to construct a measure that captures not only if a country has participated in a trade agreement or not, but also captures the depth of the trade agreement. And here is this table gives you a brief idea of what these trade agreements look like. So we use information from the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, from the World Trade Organization, uh, the go go uh, Government Procurement Agreement, and then 279 preferential trade agreements. And these agreements cover, for the most part, the trade in goods and services, but in many cases, they also cover the flow of people or capital. So they, they are very uh, comprehensive measures of international integration. As I mentioned earlier, not all countries sign everything. So we, we look at these provisions and depending on how many they have signed, we construct measures of the intensity of international integration. And then we sum up over the population of these countries. We do the same, but summing up no, not over population, but over uh, income per capita of these countries. And then we construct, based on these two measures, we construct relative measures of integration. So how big is your integrated international market relative to your own population or relative to your own per capita income? Um, uh, we think that this has several advantages compared to using, let's say, trade flows to capture international integration. One is that the measure is based on trade agreements, which are actionable by governments directly, and they're a policy variable. Uh, and they're not outcomes. They're not outcomes like trade flows. Uh, second, it allows us to distinguish between the role of raw population versus income when you connect to other countries. Uh, that turns out to be quite interesting. So if a country connects to a populous country, if a country connects to China, is this more or less viable compared, uh, compared to connecting to a country that may be smaller in size in terms of population, but have uh, uh, higher per capita income. So let's say Germany or Switzerland. And finally, um, one interesting feature of this measure is that it depends both on the integration efforts of our own country and also the integration of the rest of the world. And here the role of China is very interesting. And you see that immediately in our integration measure. So let me show you what happens in this graph. This shows you the integration measure, the, the two integration measures we develop for uh, countries that are members of the World Trade Organization. And so you can see how the measure develops over the years. So uh, the, the red line shows the integrated market in terms of population. And so the integrated market in terms of population rises in the 90s. And then in 2001, it jumps up. So what happens here? China enters the World Trade Organization. So all of a sudden, the access to, um, to China means that all WTO members have access to a much larger population. That's the red line. But see what happens to the blue line. The blue line measures integration in terms of per capita income. When China enters, then the per capita income of the integrated market falls sharply as China was relatively poor at that time. And you can see this pattern if you construct these graphs for many parts of the world, you can see this pattern very clearly. And it has implications for the way we think about the role of trade for many parts of the world. So for example, one line that I like to look at is the, the purple line here that represents Sub-Saharan Africa. And again, in terms of population, you can see what happens, especially in the, you know, in the, in the last few decades, once they start trading with China, their access to uh, markets in terms of population explodes, it goes way up, but look what happens in terms of per capita income. And what this means is that for many of these countries, the entry of China does not represent access to international markets with, with large purchasing power. It represents access to markets uh, or it, it represents um, competition for markets that are much larger than they are. So here, you know, in, in integration plays a very different role that can potentially um, could potentially have a negative effect on these countries. 
So I talked about the international, our measure of international market size. Now let me talk about our measure of domestic market size. In this framework, domestic market size depends on raw population that can easily be measured and on the income distribution. And specifically, and again, that's where the model is helpful. We measure the fraction of people in the global middle class. Why global? Because this technology is assumed to be global. It's available to everyone. Uh, so following the work of Karaj, we define the global middle class as being people who, are, who have uh, earnings between 11 and $110 per day. So the idea here is that uh, we want to include people in the global, in this global middle class that are not poor in the poor rich countries, and they are not rich in the rich countries. So I'm sure it takes some time to process what I said, but essentially, let, let me give you a specific uh, example. Take the average of the national poverty lines of Portugal and Italy. So Portugal and Italy are both high income countries, but they tend to be among the, the poorer rich countries. So we want to make sure that the people who are in the global middle class are not considered poor in these countries. So the lower bound for our measure uh, is given by the, by the average of the national poverty lines in Portugal and Italy. Then take Luxembourg. Luxembourg is one of the richest countries in the world. And we, we, we consider as an upper bound of our measure twice the median income in Luxembourg. So we want the people who are in the global middle class are not going to be rich in a country like Luxembourg. That's the idea of this measure. And again, the patterns when it comes to the global middle class as defined here are quite interesting. Uh, you may think, first of all, that the global middle class goes hand in hand with poverty and per capita income. This is not true. And uh, you can see that in these graphs here, which for various periods correlate the sustained poverty reduction as a measure with uh, the percentage of uh, the population in the global middle class. Of course, at, a ve at very low per capita income levels, the global middle class is almost zero, as you can see there. But then when you're in uh, uh, per capita income levels between $3,000 and $20,000 per capita, you can see that there is wide dispersion in uh, the share of people who are in the global middle class. So the, the share of global middle class varies considerably across countries. Um, another interesting pattern is if you compare across years, so again, one could write potentially um, a different paper on that, is that the share of people in the global middle class in rich countries declines uh, in recent years. So the, the middle class is shrinking. That's another interesting pattern in this data. Let me now talk briefly about the empirical results. So uh, very briefly, we find that these three variables that are key in the hypothesis I presented, so the, the variables that capture market size, namely middle class, the percentage of population in the global middle class, the uh, international, the measure of international integration in terms of relative population of the integrated market, and the measure of integration in terms of the relative income of the integrated market, are highly significant and very important. And given that these numbers don't mean anything to you, um, I, I'll try to put some, some uh, meat uh, into these numbers and tell you what the interpretation is. So first, before I do that, let me just briefly say that um, the parameter uh, estimates are consistent with the hypothesis of increasing returns to scale in the sense that uh, there is a constant in the fixed costs and, and that is positive. This is the, the, the least you would expect if you assume that there are constant returns to scale operating. We find not surprisingly that all institutional and geographical factors are highly, are, are highly significant. Um, this is again, very much consistent with, uh, with uh, earlier work. As a measure of fit, we use a measure that's often used in the machine learning literature these days, namely the area under the, uh, and then the receiver operating characteristics curve. So essentially, this is uh, a measure that captures the, the share of positive, of, of true, of correct predictions in the model. So <clears throat> the uh, number of times that the model predicts instances of poverty reduction correctly, and the number of times the model correctly predicts instances of no poverty reduction as a share of a random guess. So in a random guess, the share would be 0.5. Uh, 
So our measure, our our uh, our measure of AOUC is 0.735. So it's it's actually considerably better than a random guess. Um, in terms of what the coefficients mean, so our coefficient estimates imply that increasing the share of population in the global middle class by 10% is equivalent to adding 54 million people to the population. So we, we employ a normalization uh, when we estimate the model that allows us to interpret all results in terms of raw population. Um, so uh, the middle class, the, the, the middle class share is very important. We also find that the international market size is very important, uh, both when measured by relative population and when measured by relative income per capita. However, the relative income per capita is, is much more important. So in other words, for countries, it's much more important to trade with rich countries than it is to trade with uh, populous countries. And again, to give you some idea of what this means, given our estimates, Integrating with a country with the same population in our framework is equivalent to adding 160,000 people. Uh, integrating with a country with the same income per capita is equivalent to adding 20 million people. Okay, so uh, income per capita is much more important because it translates to higher purchasing power. Uh, let me give you one concrete example to see how this works. Take a country like Afghanistan. Its population is 35 million. So suppose it integrates with Iran or Pakistan. So relative to Afghanistan, Iran's population, uh, uh, Iran is, is more populous. It has 2.3 times the population of Afghanistan. So it would be equivalent if uh, Afghanistan trades with Iran, it would be equivalent to adding 360,000 people. If it trades with Pakistan, Pakistan is even larger, 5.7 times the size of Afghanistan, that would be equivalent to adding more people, 912,000 people. But now, if you make the same calculation in terms of income, Iran has 10 times the per capita income of Afghanistan. So then it would be equivalent to adding 200 million people. If, you, if, if Afghanistan traded with Iran, it would be equivalent to adding 200 million people. If it uh, trades with Pakistan, if it or I should be more precise if it became integrated with Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan has three times the per capita income of Afghanistan. Uh, and again, this is the old Afghanistan. Uh, that would be equivalent to adding 60 million people in the population. So per capita income is much more important um, as an integration measure than population. I mentioned before that the threshold market size in this model is 320 million people. So this number is to be interpreted as people who are below the, the global middle class. And again, to remind you in this framework, there are, three, there are three ways that countries can achieve this threshold. A, it can be achieved through raw population. So which countries have, uh, more, have more than 328 million people, India and China. Uh, I'm, I'm not counting the United States because the United States is already a high income country. A second way is by increasing the middle class, and that implies domestic redistribution. And the third way is through international integration. So international integration here is very important. And that's why I said at the outset, this was not meant to be a trade paper or a talk about trade, but nevertheless, it's inevitable that one comes away with a message that without trade, it's really impossible for the smaller countries to reduce poverty. Um, uh, uh, the middle class here is also very important. And finally, let me you know, conclude by showing you some graphs of what this implies for specific parts of the world or specific countries. So what you see in this graph is countries grouped by decile of GDP per capita. So they are grouped in 10 deciles. And then the, the dotted line here denotes the 320 million, which is the threshold, the threshold market size for uh, achieving sustained poverty reduction. So uh, what you see is that, uh, so I'm sorry, the blue, uh, the blue bars um, denote the share of the countries that can achieve sustained poverty reduction at current levels of integration. So without further integration, but without less integration, and also at the current levels of uh, inequality in their countries. And so the red ones denote the 
poverty reduction levels that could be achieved if these economies uh, were closed. And you can see immediately that for the first five deciles, it would have been impossible to uh, uh, reduce poverty if these economies were closed. Even when they're open at current levels, uh, in, uh, in the first case, it's impossible, in, for the first decile, it's impossible to reduce poverty, and the other ones are barely above the line. So, so for poorer countries, it's very hard to reduce, um, to, reduce to, to achieve sustained poverty reduction. Uh, if they were closed, even when they're open at current levels of integration, it's still they're barely above the, the threshold. Of course, another counterfactual, and perhaps this is something we can do, is also consider what would, what would happen if actually adopted, if these countries adopted the maximum level of integration. Um, you can do that for many different parts of the world. And again, I, I don't particularly like this, uh, this, this uh, grouping uh, because it, um, in each group, there are highly heterogeneous countries, but it follows very much the World Bank classification system. And again, you can see the problem in sub-Saharan Africa, that at current levels of integration, the continent as a whole cannot achieve sustained poverty reduction. And again, I emphasize that the reason I, I the, the point of this framework is that in this framework, I didn't talk about human capital. I didn't talk about institutions. These are controlled for, but these are not the factors driving development. The factor that drives development in this framework is market size. And the point here is that sub-Saharan Africa does not have the, the market size needed in order to support development. And finally, you can also do that for many individual countries. And again, you can see uh, how difficult it is for many African economies to achieve sustained poverty reduction, given their market size. It's no problem in China, even if China were closed, uh, it, would, it would have achieved poverty reduction. Indonesia, uh, Philippines, uh, uh, same thing. Uh, in Ethiopia and Ghana, this, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, these countries are barely above the threshold. So uh, again, market size seems to be an important constraint in many of these countries. And one more uh, uh, thing I want to emphasize here when we talk about market size, it's at the national level. So uh, I consider uh, Ethiopia or Ghana as one market. So this abstracts completely from the fact that within these countries, in many cases, markets are segmented. So within these countries, um, as, as recent work has shown, often cities tend to be cut off from other parts or, or uh, small villages, small rural areas tend to be cut off from the rest of the economy. So this would make the effective market size even smaller. So these calculations do not take that into account, but even if you consider one country, just one dot at the map, even then, you see that African African countries tend not to have the, the, the necessary market size to support development. So let me conclude uh, with, with the main insights from this work. So I, I don't think of this paper as being a policy paper. It's not a paper that is going to tell people what policies they need to adopt to, uh, to, to, to uh, achieve poverty reduction. However, um, I still think that there are some messages that are relevant to policy. The first one is that for a small country, it's nearly impossible to eliminate poverty if it's closed. Um, as I said earlier, this is not surprising, but in the current uh, environment, in the current political environment, where countries are turning, advanced countries are turning inward, uh, it's important to, to remember that. Uh, second, the size of the domestic market can potentially compensate for lack of trade. So the first message, naturally raises the question, so what is a small country supposed to do? Um, our answer is that if the country happens to have a large enough market like India, uh, the domestic market can compensate for the, for the lack of trade, and that's where these fundamentals come in, then if this country adopts the right policies, the, the, the right, it improves its institutions, it improves, it improves its processes, it improves its human capital, then it can actually take off. However, the domestic market needs to be very large, above 300 million for the domestic increase in returns to scale and for this process to kick in. Okay. So in that case, if a country is too small and cut off from the rest of the world, even if it adopted the right policies, even if it improved its human capital, even if it improved its institutions, it wouldn't manage to, uh, to uh, achieve sustained poverty reduction. So in that case, what is a small country supposed to do? 
um, deep integration can potentially substitute for, for a small domestic market. And what I mean by that is if a country connects with other countries, um, not just superficially in terms of uh, signing just for, uh, for, for, for low tariffs, but actually um, by adopting uh, deep integration measures as captured in these uh, trade agreements that I showed you earlier, then it can effectively create a larger market that can substitute for the small domestic market. That said, this is a, a, an, an enormous challenge. We have never experienced such deep integration, not even in the European Union, but it's one of the most integrated markets. However, there, there, there is really a need to achieve this level of deep integration in the African continent where the market size is really very small. And finally, the one thing that countries may be uh, more able to influence uh, without cooperation from other countries is a certain degree of equality. And here, equality has a very specific meaning, namely the existence of a large middle class can partially compensate for the small market. So that would um, uh, imply that redistribution policies that make sure that the ownership of assets is more widely distributed across the population are policies that would actually effectively increase the market size in these countries and, and help them achieve um, a larger market size. So uh, to conclude, in the current policy environment in which countries, advanced countries have started turning inward, growth at a certain degree of equality, not complete equality, but a certain degree of equality, equality in the sense of a larger middle class uh, can be a complement and a not substitute for growth. And I will stop here. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Um, so I have not been able to follow the chat. Um, feel free to ask questions and uh... Yes, uh, thank you, Penny, for the very interesting talk. Let me uh, let me add some of the questions that we received. Uh, so one question from Lin Lin Fan. Uh, asks whether one should worry about uh, import competition from, from large countries like China destroying jobs. Uh, I, let me read, the, I think there are only two or three questions, so I'll read them all for you. Uh, the second by Ilya Kukhev is, is whether the extent of the market uh, limits the division of labor. So can uh, Rather than thinking about increasing returns to scale, he's asking um, whether we can think of uh, limits to the division of labor as related to size of market. Um, and uh, uh, Narcisin is asking a specific question on Nigeria, where uh, he says that in Nigeria, imports are increasing relative to exports. Uh, uh, isn't that uh, suggestive that uh, maybe demand is not a binding constraint? So I think these are the main questions that I have seen. Um, uh, thank you. These are, very, these are very good questions. So let me answer them in reverse order. Uh, I hope I won't forget the questions. <clears throat> in Nigeria, uh, 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 imports, uh, having high imports does not imply that you have the right preconditions for development. So in our framework, if the, if the luxury class, if, uh, if a few oligarchs buy luxury goods, if they buy um, cars or, uh, or uh, if, they, if they build nice houses and they bring furniture from abroad, um, the imports may be high, but this, doesn't, this kind of uh, demand doesn't generate spillovers. What is key in this model, and that's why I uh, emphasize the role of the middle class, is that uh, the demand is targeted towards mass-produced products that are produced through this increasing returns to scale technology. 
Um, that is the key. And so, uh, and I don't think this is the case in Nigeria. So that's, that's the channel we emphasize. Uh, the second, about the division of labor, um, uh, certainly, but again, I would make the point that um, the, the whole point of comparative advantage of theories, comparative advantage, is that they allow for the gains from division of labor in international setting. So to the extent that the country can connect to other countries, it can enjoy the gains from division of labor internationally. At least this is the theory behind it. So again, that's a case where uh, the, the, the international market could compensate for the lack of, uh, for, the, for the limitations of the domestic market. And finally, the, the question about import competition, and th this is a very uh, good question. Um, you may think that in some cases, it might make sense for a country to actually close itself from, to protect itself from international competition. That's the classic infant industry protection argument. Um, so th th that's certainly the case, but for this to happen, it, it is, important, it is necessary that this country is already producing something. So if production has taken off, if uh, the country already produces this increasing returns to scale good, then it might make sense in the initial stages of, of uh, this production to adopt some measures uh, to protect itself from import competition to make sure that the market size remains large. The point uh, we are making here is that uh, in order to achieve this stage, in order to start producing this product, uh, in order to, to start producing in the first place uh, and enter this international competition, you need to have the necessary market size. You need, to, uh, you need to meet this threshold condition. And if you don't meet this threshold condition, you never get to the point of competing. So in that case, and um, um, again, if the country is large enough and can support this threshold condition by itself, that's fine. But if the country does not have the necessary domestic size to do that, the only alternative is to connect to international markets. So, sorry, sorry, Guido, you are, you are muted. Yeah, I'm muted, thank you. We have received a couple more questions. One by Angus Deaton. Uh, he says that equalizing incomes in many African countries seems like a very heavy lift. How much would have to be done? It doesn't seem very hopeful. Uh, and uh, a second question by Glenn Nielsen is uh, uh, about movement of people. Of people, uh, uh, how do you think that uh, movement of people would uh, change the conclusions about uh, market size? Is would that be a useful integration to your framework? Um, let me start with the second one. So, movement of people is the ultimate integration. That would completely eliminate the constraint. Uh, but that's perhaps the, the it's really the, the true frontier of globalization and, and, and we are not close to that. We're not anywhere close to that. But of course, you know, if you could offer your services anywhere in the world, then the markets, the market size constraint would stop to exist. Here I talked about trade in goods and services as uh, trading goods actually as being a, one way to overcome the market size constraint. Of course, if you have trade in factors of production, uh, if you have factor mobility, then this constraint is completely eliminated. So um, that's reg to the, with regards to the second question. Um, with regards to, to Angus's question, of course, it's very hard. There is no question about that. And, and, and I'm not talking about total equality here, but I would argue that uh, adopting redistributive policies, um, uh, you know, uh, adopting policies that brings us that, that bring us closer to a more equitable distribution of resources. It's something that's very much within the power of countries. And it's something that's within the power of individual countries, while the degree of international integration is outside uh, uh, their capabilities right now. So, uh, you know, if you're in Somalia or Ethiopia, you may think it, it would be great to have access to the more lucrative US or UK market. But this is not going to happen, not in the current environment. So we may talk about international integration and the importance of trade, but it takes two to trade. And if the other side is not willing, then the developing countries can do nothing about it. The one thing they can do is focus on 
on their domestic economies. And what I'm saying is that in addition to trying to improve human capital and improve their institutions and so on, none of this is easy. In addition to that, trying to have a more equal distribution of resources is within their power. Sorry, you are muted again. Yes, so I think I, we can call it an end. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your very, very interesting talk and best wishes to everyone who has been listening to us. Good day. Thank you very good much. Night, depending on your time. <laughs>